Our next speaker is Milking Technology Specialist Ian Onstad. Ian is internationally recognised for his research in milking technology and he leads the Dairy Group team of experts who provide independent advice on hygienic milk production and mastitis control. He is also the chairman of the British Mastitis Conference. Ian is very kindly going to discuss the effects of teat congestion on milk flow, milk quality and cow health. So thank you ever so much, Ian. It's over to you. Thanks, Karen, for the invitation and um, good evening, everyone. Hope you're enjoying this seminar. Uh, anybody who knows me uh, knows that for years I've been fascinated by milking technology and milking techniques. It, it really floats my boat. Um, so when I was asked to look at the uh, invent technology, I, I had the, the presentation from James and uh, I have to confess it, it intrigued me. Uh, it seemed an interesting concept, but I wasn't really sure on what the effects would be. So uh, it was it was great to have an opportunity to actually spend some time looking and monitoring these systems. Uh, so that's really what I'd like to discuss tonight. So if I could have the first slide, please, Jade. So really interesting it's uh, to hear it from, from Bill and, and James uh, as practical dairy farmers. It, it's interesting to hear that, that the aim of milking uh, or machine milking, it's predominantly remained the same for years. Uh, we all want to milk cows quickly, uh, and obviously Bill and James want to milk quickly. They want to milk completely because we need to ensure that the others completely evacuated, uh, that we're capturing all the milk that's readily available to be harvested. But most importantly, we want to milk gently. And, and we've, we've heard it on two or three occasions already this evening, gently means comfortable. And so we've got this compromise. We've got to try and find a way of milking cows quickly, completely, and gently. Uh, next slide, please, Jade. So one of the uh, inevitable uh, effects of, of milking a cow with vacuum is, is that we get teat congestion. Uh, and basically congestion or thickening or swelling of a teat, it is very basically, it's the accumulation of circulatory fluids. So that's blood uh, or lymphatic fluids and it's, it's these fluids accumulating around the teat barrel and around the teat base. So the teat would begin to become slightly hard, it would become uh, swollen, and potentially in extreme cases quite discoloured. Now one of the reasons that we, uh, or one of the ways that we can mitigate the adverse effects of pulsation, uh, of, of sorry, of congestion, would be pulsation. And, and one of the very first milking machines developed by a Scotsman called Mr. Merkland failed singularly because it had no pulsation. So there was no way to, to ease or mitigate uh, the accumulation of the circulatory fluids. So the teat became swollen, congested and ultimately stopped milking. So we can manage teat congestion uh, with effective pulsation. But as James uh, just mentioned, we can also mitigate uh, teat congestion with having a liner and a teat that are adequately fitting. So a good match between the liner dimensions and the teat dimensions. So we get a good effective seal between the liner and the teat. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, a document that I, I refer to quite regularly uh, and, and I make no apologies for the fact that it's published in 1994. Uh, and I would strongly suggest anybody who has uh, an interest in milk harvesting and machine milking gets hold of a copy of this because basically it's it's a review looking at uh, teat tissue reactions to machine milking and, and one of the very strong conclusions that came from this review was that any change to the teat tissue the teat end and the teat canal will alter the risk of new mastitis infections and we've already heard from from Bill and from James that Mastitis control and mastitis levels and mastitis incidence are absolutely critical to their farm success. Uh, next slide, please. So reducing teat congestion. So we can obviously uh, have effective pulsation. We can try and ensure that we have a, a good fitting liner that's, that's suitably fitted and matching to the teat dimensions. But the other things that we can do 
include avoiding low milk flow. Now, of course, low milk flow is, is can occur at the beginning of the milking as well as at the end of the milking. Um, when we have low milk flow, we get a consequential increase in system vacuum around the teat. So when we've got a cow at peak milk flow, the vacuum that the teat is being exposed to will be reduced. So consequently, if we have a cow that's ba badly stimulated, exhibiting delayed letdown or bimodal milking, when the milk flow drops, the vacuum exposure increases. So if we're wanting to avoid low milk flow and as a consequence, higher vacuum, we've got to be really particular on pre-milking preparation. Uh, and, and both both the previous speakers have mentioned the importance of the routine. So adequately stimulating a cow, and that means stimulating her hard enough and long enough, but then leaving her to allow time for the milk letdown reflex to occur. And bearing in mind that a cow that's milked twice a day and a cow that's milked three times a day, the cow milk three times a day requires leaving longer before we attach the cluster because she has a smaller cisternal capacity. So it's all about adequate stimulation and adequate lag time. So we want to avoid over milking. So that's over milking with delayed milk let down at the start of the milking. But we also want to ensure that the ACRs are set appropriately so that we avoid over milking at the end of milking. And again, difference between a herd milk twice a day and a herd milk three times a day we would want the takeoff settings higher on a 3x herd than we would on a 2x herd. We obviously, it's a, it should be a given and it should be, uh, shouldn't have to be stated. But of course, if we're talking about reducing teat congestion and vacuum exposure of the teat, it's critical that we have suitable system vacuum. So the actual system vacuum has to be set appropriately for the position of the milk line. Next slide, please. So building on the, the picture of teat congestion, why, why it's important, why we believe that it's, it's highly relevant, uh, I just wanted to share with you three, three papers. Uh, the first paper is uh, by an Italian group headed by Zucconi, and they were looking at teat thickness changes and, and the link with intramammary infections. When they were measuring teat thickness increases, an increase of more than 5% was significantly associated with an increased infection rate. So we start to see teats becoming slightly congested. We worry about comfort or more accurately discomfort, but we also should be worrying about increased new infection rates. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was uh, a piece of work done by uh, some colleagues in Belgium when they were looking at uh, milking machine induced changes and changes in teat dimensions. Uh, what they concluded was that any increase in teat barrel diameter after milking was associated with an increased quarter somatic cell count. So we've got two very reputable pieces of work suggesting that any changes in the physical teat dimensions after milking are going to be problematic. Uh, next slide please. And then this was a, a very recent piece of work um, undertaken at the University of Wisconsin uh, only in 2017, where we were actually able to come up with a, a method of estimating teat canal, teat canal cross-sectional area, and then using that as a proxy to establish milk flow rate. And what we noticed as teat congestion began to develop within a teat, that we saw a reduction in the teat canal cross-sectional area and a consequential reduction in milk flow rate. So teat congestion, there's not much positive you can say about it. Uh, next slide, please. So we then started to look at the uh, effects of the invent in the ADF claw. And we were using um, guidelines uh, identified or developed with, by TCI, the Teat Club International. Uh, these are very industry accepted measures of teat ringing, teat congestion, and teat discoloration. When we're talking about teat ringing, this is where the, uh, the teat connects to the base of the udder. Uh, so we're looking here at three categories or three classifications. We're looking at a teat that has no ring, 
So the teak loop's absolutely normal. We're then looking at a category of a score of two, which is, is a visible ring. So a little bit like the mark your sock might leave on your leg if it's a little bit tight. So it's, it's visible, but it's not palpable. And the third category, which are the more serious uh, problems, is, is the palpable ring. So this is the, the ring at the base of the teak where it attaches to the udder, which is hard and swollen uh, and quite, dis, uh, quite uncomfortable. We then rated teak congestion, which was a measure of uh, the change in the structure of the teak. Uh, and again, we were scoring that from no congestion to severe congestion. And then following that by looking at teak color, because obviously at the end of a milking, we're looking for a teak to be normal color. If we see a, a teat that becomes red, we're, we become concerned at that point. Teats that become blue, very, very concerned with that. So when we started to look at the, uh, the effect of the invent on the cluster, you can see that there's a highly significant reduction or difference, sorry, between venting and non-venting for both teat-based rings, teat congestion and teat discoloration. A highly significant difference. Uh, next slide, please. We then went on to look at the um, split cluster effect. So we had one side of the cluster uh, with the invent enabled, and the other side of the cluster was basically just operating as, as per usual or as normal. And, and again, we were using the same um, teat classifications of, of base ringing teat congestion and teat discoloration. Uh, these, these were done on two farms that, that were kind enough to um, offer up their cows for us to play with. But more importantly, just look at the overall results. So this is rather than uh, describing in detail farm one and farm two, look at the overall results. And again, you can see highly significant differences here. And when you actually look at the uh, ringing teak congestion and teak discoloration, there's a significant improvement in all those three categories when the invent was fitted. Now bear in mind, this is on the same cow. So some of James's comments about um, difference in teak size is, is taken out by the fact that we were doing this on a split cluster uh, design. But what it does show is if you look at the scores that were uh, relatively unaffected, it demonstrates very clearly that not all cows or all teats benefit from venting, but a significant number of animals do. Uh, final slide, please. So to conclude, teat congestion, uh, I think fairly well established, uh, teat congestion increases new infection rate. Uh, teat congestion reduces peak milk flow rate. The one, that, the one point that I should add there is teat congestion significantly reduces cow comfort. And what we have been able to show is that the invent system will significantly reduce teat congestion. Thank you, anyone got any questions? Fantastic, thank you Ian. Yes, we do have a couple of questions if that's okay. Um, in your opinion, do you think that this, this new technology from ADF could improve farm profits? Anything that improves cow comfort um, and milkability is, is going to potentially be, yeah, it's, it's potentially going to be more profitable, of course. Particularly if we're seeing the um, improved milking performance, we're not, not at the moment able to demonstrate a significant reduction in mastitis cases. Um, but I think that would be fair to say, watch this space. But, but basically- Do you think the only reason for that, Ian, is that we're still in relatively early days? Is that what you mean in terms of data? Yeah, I think that it's, yeah. it's relatively early days in what we've been monitoring, correct? No, that's brilliant. And in, in your opinion, um, would you say, all herds would probably suffer some teat congestion, or is that a sweeping generalization? Oh, that's a very accurate generalization, uh, because fundamentally it, it's the combination of, of liner, <coughs> liner fit to cow teat. And, and so all herds, all herds, irrespective of a milking system, irrespective of system vacuum, 
irrespective of liner design, will have some cows that that will suffer from teat congestion. Unfortunately, it's it's a given because you can never, as, as James said, until the day arrives where we have teats that are uniform within a cow and between cows, we will always have teat congestion. And as a consequence, we will always have uncomfortable milking for some some cows. And in your professional opinion, do you think we can get there? I, I, I think we can get there and I think we have to get there, correct. Very interesting. Right, sorry, I'm taking Chair's prerogative a bit to the limit here, aren't I? Um, so we've got a lovely question here from Chris Heenan. Why is the vent at the top of the unit? Is there a difference between vents being closer to the teat opening beneath the teat compared to having the vent at the top, like in ADF? Yeah, so the, I'm imagining that the, the question is referring um, to some unit or some milking liners that will have a vent in the short milk tube. And, and the benefit of the vent in the short milk tube is to, to help remove milk away from the end of the teat. It has no effect or minimal effect on the vacuum in the head of the liner. And, and as James's graphic showed, as the if the teat is ill-fitting in the liner, vacuum is going around the side of the teat into the head of the liner. We need some vacuum there because if we have no vacuum, the units will just fall off. But but it's the excessive vacuum that becomes problematic because while the liner is opening and closing, it's certainly helping to, to mitigate and reduce the teat congestion in about the bottom 25 millimeters of the teat. Yeah. But an opening and closing liner cannot mitigate the effects of vacuum on the teat barrel or around the mouthpiece. Okay. So that's where the, the vent's required at the mouthpiece to, to stop the congestion building at the top of the teat. Okay, great. Again, Ian, we have got more questions. Um, if we do have chance at the end, we'll come back. If not, we'll put these questions to you and then we'll get them back to the people that ask them, if that's okay. Thank you ever so much for your presentation and for your time. We really, really appreciate it.